Hello, welcome to the afternoon session, the last, the last, uh, the last session of this uh, conference. Um, my name is Gabriel Perez Quiroz. I, I work for the Bank of Spain. And then the first speaker that we are going to have, the keynote speaker, is going to be uh, Jennifer Castle from Oxford University. Okay, thank you very much. And let me thank the uh, organizers for this very kind invitation and for some really fascinating talks over the past two days, which have been really enjoyable. Uh, so this paper is on forecasting UK inflation. So a couple of uh, disclaimers or apologies. First, I'm afraid it's frequentist, um, so that may come as a shock. Um, secondly, I'm afraid it's only point forecasts, so again, apologies for that. Um, but And thirdly, uh, I'm afraid it's based on UK data, and of course I'm in a room full of Europeans here, uh, but hopefully you'll see that the methodology can apply more generally. Um, so let me start by just motivating the question. Uh, as I'm sure has been the case in uh, Europe as well, there's been a big shock to uh, UK inflation. We've got uh, CPI inflation in the top panel there and CPI food inflation. And over 2022, we've had this massive rise in inflation, both in food and energy. Um, in the UK, energy prices at the consumer level are regulated, but you can see the huge jumps over 2022. Uh, and so the interesting question is really how these big shocks to food and energy are feeding through to inflation. So the aim of this paper is to understand how the costs of energy feed through to both inflation and the broader economy. And we're going to try and produce some projections of UK inflation based on various energy scenarios. And the methods that we're going to use are to look at very long run time series of data. And the reason for doing so, I'm going to look at about 160 years of data. And the advantage of doing that is that we've got shocks like this in the past. We've had wars in the past. We've had pandemics in the past. We've had huge inflation spikes in the past. So using a long run time series of data enables us to identify uh, the model. So I'm going to build four different models. And these are all going to be conditional models. I'm going to build models of wages, prices, unemployment, and productivity. And the reason these are all separate built is that we've got uh, quite a lot of non-linearity feeding through and you'll see why it's very difficult to build the whole system but we test for super exogeneity for each of the equations and then we can actually uh, put all of those equations together into a system at the end. So as I've just emphasized the big advantage of using this long run time series of data is that we've got this past variation that we can use but of course there's a drawback this is going to be annual data and that's not very helpful when one wants to forecast inflation uh, in the current climate and so what we're going to do is use more rapid high frequency data to update our forecast based on this annual projections that we're going to produce. So let me show you some of the data that we're going to model. Here we've got UK wages and prices over this 160 year period. So UK wages have risen 700 fold, prices 100 fold. So there's a huge amount of variation in the data and that really helps with identification. And look at wages and prices, uh, wage and price inflation. We've had periods where inflation have hit over 20% before. So that's very useful when we're looking at inflation running upwards of 10% in the current climate. As well as that, um, one of the key aspects over this very long time series is just how remarkably constant the co-integrating relation has been. So this is UK real wages in the red line and the dashed blue line is UK productivity. Just look at how close they move together. That's going to provide our co-integration over this long run time series. But I'll also note, look at the flatlining um, post-financial crisis. This is a real issue in the UK about the flatlining of productivity. And another interesting aspect has been what's happened to the energy use. So this is energy consumption over this long time series. So total fuel consumption is the red line. And initially, it was almost all coal consumption. Uh, but then we started to diversify into gas and uh, oil and uh, since renewables. And now, actually, coal consumption is near zero. But you can see that there's been a flatlining of total fuel consumption. And that's due to big efficiencies since the 1960s. So this is the kind of data that we're going to use, the variation in that, to identify contributing factors to inflation. 
So this is a brief root map of what I'll talk about. I'll build the conditional models of wage inflation, unemployment, productivity, and price inflation initially, and then I'll show how we combine those conditional models. But then if we want to do some forecasting, I'm going to ba uh, base these forecasts on some assumptions, so we'll make some scenario projections based on higher frequency data, and then I'll give you some uh, forecasts for 2023 and 2024 before concluding. So what's the modeling approach behind this? Well, as you've seen from this data, there's clearly non-constancy of change. This data is really highly volatile. So we're going to use a general to specific strategy, allowing for break detection over the entire period and allowing for non-linearities. So we're allowing for structural breaks, non-linearities, and unknown sets of uh, variables, explanatory variables. So we're going to start by building a general unrestricted model for each of these conditional models will include intercepts, lag, lags of the dependent variables, and a huge range of conditioning variables that are all motivated by theory and past evidence. Then we'll include polynomials for possible nonlinearities, and you'll see that we'll map to, say, smooth transition models using those nonlinearities. We include step, impulse, and trend indicator saturation, so this allows us to detect for outliers and location shifts and trend breaks over the entire period. And then we're going to do selection, model selection. We'll retain the regressors and select for the nonlinearities and the impulses at a very tight significance level. So we really have a prior that, that um, these shouldn't enter unless they're really there, if they're very significant. So we select at 0.1%. Then once we've picked up any breaks and outliers, we'll select over the regressors at a 1% significance level, and then we undertake further transformations for co-integration to include the long-run information. And then finally, we do super-exogeneity testing, given the conditional uh, single equation conditional models, and we find that the resulting equations are congruent encompassing models, so we're content to proceed with these single equation models. So, if uh, it's straight after lunch and you're all a bit tired and you'd like to switch off, let me give you the brief summary. This is what the th four models look like, and then I'll go into some detail. But if you get this slide, then you can have a short doze. So the wage inflation model, the real wages, uh, real wage inflation is driven by productivity and the markup along with a really important nonlinearity, which is a wage price spiral, and an additional nonlinearity coming through uh, an, un, uh, an unemployment relation. So there's a lot of nonlinearity in the wage inflation, which is really going to drive the inflation forecasts. Unemployment is a remarkably simple model. In unemployment over this 160-year period is explained by real borrowing costs over revenues, which we proxy by output growth. And it fits remarkably well over this period, including the COVID period. Productivity, we model a, a production function. So we have labor productivity driven by capital per worker and energy per unit of capital. And we use trend breaks to capture the changes in technology. And then finally, our price inflation model uh, depends on both short and long-term interest rates, uh, broad money growth, commodity prices, which is really important in the current climate, world inflation, and unit labor costs. So they're the four models that I'll build, and then I'll show how we combine them. So let's start with the model of real wage growth. So this model uh, looks very complicated. Uh, uh, I'll take you through it step by step. But the first thing to, to explain is we're modeling the real wage growth. That's uh, the dependent variable here. And the first thing I want to convince you of is that it's a well-specified model. So in the top panels here, we've got the model fit and uh, the uh, inter indicator adjustments. So these are the breaks that the model picks up. We've got the scaled residuals and forecast errors, the residual density and residual autocorrelation function. This, for such a long time series of data, is a very nicely specified model. So we're happy that it's congruent. So what is actually going on in the model? Well, the first thing that's going on is we've got a short run impact of changes in productivity on real wages, and that's roughly about 0.5. So there's a fairly rapid incorporation of productivity increases into real wages. Uh, but notice that this is symmetric. There's no nonlinearity in that. So it also reflects the dampening of real wages due to the productivity slowdown in uh, 2008. 
as well as the productivity growth, we've got this strong equilibrium correction mechanism. And you saw that in the data of um, real wages and productivity trending very closely together. So we've got a long run feedback to real unit labor costs of about 20%. So that's a half life of just under four years, which is a fairly rapid uh, incorporation. Now, this coefficient is really important. This is a non-linear term reflect, reflecting a wage price spiral. So let me show you what this thing looks like. We've got, we saturated the model with um, polynomials, and we found evidence that uh, uh, the Taylor expansion was a close approximation for our smooth transition model. And so we've got a smooth transition, a logistic smooth transition uh, function in annualized squared inflation. So that's the transition variable. We select the threshold and the speed of transition by grid search, and the actual data is using uh, observed data. So the function here is this smooth transition function here. So what's going on? It's actually adjusted by a minus one. So down at the bottom here at zero um, inflation, this is minus one. At that point, there's very little reaction uh, of real wages to price inflation. So workers are inattentive. They have no idea that inflation, well, inflation is very low, so they ignore it and they don't make any wage demands on it. But as inflation rises, you can see as we get up to about 10%, workers are really attentive. They realize their real wages are being eroded, and so they're pushing for uh, wage, nominal wage rises to match price inflation. And up at this uh, zero on the F function, that's 100% pass-through. That means workers are demanding 100% compensation for the rise in inflation. So if uh, inflation is exceeding about 6 to 8%, then uh, we should start to see wage price spirals. And of course, inflation at the moment in the UK is up at 8.7%, and there's clear evidence of these second round effects through wage price spirals coming through. Now, the next um, thing in the model is a nonlinear unemployment term. So we've got unemployment. It's just demeaned over this 160-year period. Unemployment's roughly 5%. But the quadratic term comes in as well. So initially, well, let me show you what that function looks like. So this is a nonlinear unemployment function. Initially, as the unemployment rate rises, the impact on real wages falls. That's the standard uh, relationship that you would expect. But once unemployment hits about 8%, now the impact on real wages actually starts to rise again. So initially we have this loss of workers' bargaining power, but then we get this movement along the marginal product curve, which raises the real wages of those still employed, uh, both from more capital per worker and from the employed being more productive. And so actually we get this upturn in um, the uh, impact on real wages. That goes to show unemployment is certainly involuntary in this world. OK, what else do we have in the model? We've got three step shifts all around the first, uh, Second World War. And these are step shifts that cannot be explained by any of the variables in the model. OK, so these are step indicators been picked up by searching over the entire sample. And they are not explained by the other variables in the model, including productivity. And uh, the uh, sort of most realistic ex explanation of what's going on here is that there's been an increase in female labor force participation from the Second World War and a rapid upskilling of labor. And so we get this upward shift, and it's a really big upward shift. So pre-Second World War, um, real wage growth was about 0.8%. After the Second World War, it jumps to 1.7%. So a really big shift um, from the Second World War effect which needs to be modeled. Finally, we've got a step shift in 2012. This reverses, unfortunately, the uh, growth that we saw post Second World War. Growth shifts down by about 2% per annum. And again, none of the variables in the model can explain this step shift. But it really is fundamental to being able to forecast over the following period. So uh, then you might say, well, hang on, you've got all these indicators, these step shifts in the model, and you're not really telling me where they're coming from. Uh, the difficulty with step indicator saturation is that it's atheoretic. Uh, we don't have a strong economic argument because we're searching for these step shifts uh, on a data-based uh, method. And actually, uh, one way to think about this is whether you can identify these step shifts or in outliers, these impulses, um, due to economic 
variables. So one argument might be, well, of course, over this long time period, the UK had a lot of incomes policies, uh, prices and wage controls, and so can we think of the indicators as essentially picking up price and wage controls? Anyway, we test for that, and we find evidence that actually we can't explain uh, the data from uh, wage and price controls. So we reject that interpretation. Then the next question is, can we, uh, are we, are we okay to model this as a conditional model? Because of course we've got contemporaneous variables on the uh, right hand side. And so we need to ensure we've got super exogeneity. So under the null hypothesis, the parameters in that conditional model that I just showed you must be invariant to the shifts in the marginal models of any included regressors. Okay, but notice that we've got indicators step shifts already in the conditional model. So you might say, hang on, how can you test for super exogeneity given that you've already got these step shifts? Well, uh, it's quite important to note that actually the test for super exogeneity is not impugned by the presence of common shifts in both the conditional and the marginal models. So if you've got common shifts in both the conditional and the marginal model, they will stay in there and then you test for the significance of any shifts in the marginal model plugged into the conditional model over and above those common shifts. And so we do that. We, uh, we run a VAR uh, with two lags in output per worker, price inflation, and the unemployment rate, retaining all regressors, and again, selecting the in outliers and step shifts at a tight significance level. We find 10 impulses and seven step indicators found, and then we put those into the conditional model and test for their significance. And we conclude that it's valid to condition on the uh, contemporaneous regressors. In other words, we have super exogeneity. So I hope you're confident that that's a good model for real wage growth. Uh, these are the forecasts, and I show you these, uh, so I call them forecasts, they're not really forecasts, they're sort of uh, uh, in-sample model fit, as it were, using, current, uh, using known regressors. But the interesting thing is over the COVID pandemic crash and recovery, actually, the model does extremely well. So uh, that's one model. Let me move on to the unemployment rate model. And this is a really simple model. We model unemployment as uh, saying, Employment is going to increase if it's profitable to hire people. And we proxy that uh, as revenue minus costs. So what are revenues? Well, we proxy changes in revenues as changes in GDP. And uh, we've seen evidence of that through the co-integrating relation that essentially uh, that uh, relationship holds. In terms of the costs, well, capital costs depend on real borrowing costs. So we just look at the uh, long-term interest rate uh, minus uh, inflation. So combined, that gives us a measure called the profits proxy. And you can see in the data here, that's the blue line, it actually closely maps to the unemployment rate. So we build a model of the unemployment rate. This is the unemployment rate on lags of itself and the profits proxy. Uh, we don't include nonlinear terms here. There's not strong evidence of nonlinearity. But of course, we do include um, structural breaks and outliers. And we pick those up using saturation techniques. Then we transform to a dynamic model in differences. And we get a long run relation here of the unemployment rate, essentially, if uh, the long-term interest rate equals the real growth rate, then the profits proxy would be zero, and equilibrium unemployment would be about 5%, and that essentially matches what we see unemployment to be over this last 160 years. So earlier in sample periods saw really huge key changes. If you think about what's happened over 160 years, we've had two world wars, we've had uh, the introduction of unemployment benefits, huge industrial changes, all of these things have gone on. And yet this model only picks up one difference than two impulse indicators, just one explanatory variable, and yet this model fits very well. So I think this is quite a remarkable model. To try and convince you that the model fits well, we've got the data, uh, the change in the unemployment rate and model fits in the blue line in the top panel there, the uh, scaled residuals, the one step ahead forecasts, including COVID period, residual density autocorrelogram, uh, auto and the intercept adjustment, you can see we just need four uh, outliers to be corrected there. <laughs> 
So that's the second model. The third model is the production function. So we're going to augment a production function with energy data. That's a key component of uh, the UK uh, data. And as you can see here, we've got the red line is total fuel consumption. And that consists of an energy mix that's been changing over time but also the actual total co uh, fuel consumption's flattened off since the 1960s as well, and that reflects increased efficiency. You can see the uptick in renewables here, the green line, um, which is only just starting to outweigh all of the other um, uh, fuels. But what's quite remarkable over this long time period is that we've seen a 90% fall in the ratio of energy use to capital stock. Look at that huge increase in efficiency over time. So that's energy per unit of capital stock has really dramatically declined. So how do we model this? Well, we're going to use exactly the same methodology that I've used for the previous two models. We build a dynamic model of output based on capital, labor, and energy. We use impulse, step, and trend saturation. And now notice that we're doing trend saturation as well. So this allows for a broken trend in every period, and that's going to be picking up changes in technology. We test for homogeneity and we can impose that restriction. So we end up with an equilibrium correction model of productivity, output per worker, or the change in output per worker as a function of capital per worker and energy per unit of capital. And that gives us a long run relation here at the bottom with the indicators capturing changes in total factor productivity. Again, we have to test for super exogeneity. Can I convince you that it's okay to model this as a single equation model? So we test for the invariance of the coefficients. So we model energy per unit of capital as a function of output per worker, capital per worker, and the lags of energy per capital. Select the uh, step and trend saturation at a tight significance level, and then put those into the conditional model, and we find evidence of super exogeneity. So again, we can use this as a single equation model. We can then solve out for the long run to obtain a production function. And that's our production function here. A sensible coefficient on labor. You might think, hang on, that's a very high coefficient on energy compared to capital stock. And I would agree, I'd take the joint combination of capital and energy uh, together. Uh, but you know, one can justify uh, the coefficient on energy uh, because essentially uh, energy use really was crucial to uh, the development. And does the model fit? Well, again, let me convince you, this is the model fit and residuals, residual density and autocorrelogram, and the intercept adjustment. Notice we need, again, very few intercept adjustments, so outliers, but we do have one in the very last observation, 2021. That's COVID going on here. Uh, and notice the advantage of using saturation techniques because we can pick up outliers at the very beginning and end of the sample as well. So other uh, break detection techniques would have struggled to pick up this very last outlier. And then finally, the fourth model, a model of price inflation. So again, the same methodology. We're going to have a, a dynamic model of the GDP deflator uh, applying saturation and selection. And the variables we're going to have in our model are excess demand for output, money, national debt, unemployment, exchange rate, unit labor costs, interest rates, wages, world, and energy prices. So everything that you think could matter for inflation should be in there. We come up with our price inflation model. Note that actually it doesn't go right back to 1860. Unfortunately, we're still working on that um, because the Second World War period really did have some quite big shocks to inflation that we're modeling. But let me explain what's going on in the model. This is the model fit and residuals, residual density and autocorrelogram, and actually the model uh, fits very well. So what's going on? Well, we've got some inflation inertia. So lagged inflation plays a role. Uh, on the monetary side, we've got the growth rate of broad money matters, the change in the short-term interest rate matters, and the short-long spread uh, matters as well. Then we've got commodity price inflation. That enters in there. You'll note that actually that's a tiny coefficient, and in fact, it's insignificant. Despite that, we're going to keep it in because we're going to have a huge change in commodity prices uh, to forecast. Okay, and you'll see that despite the tiny coefficient on it, it's actually going to play a big role in inflation forecasting. As well as that, we've got changes in unit labor costs. 
And now you can start to see, I've made an argument for this big nonlinearity in the real wage equation. That's going to feed through unit labor costs here. So the nonlinearity from that model will feed into the price inflation model. Then we have world inflation that also matters. And we have, again, uh, we've aggregated the uh, outliers and step shifts into an index of retained indicator variables. And that's uh, mostly covering wars and previous crises. Then there's this interesting step shift. This is, we've called it the China effect. Um, so there's a step shift uh, in 1993, and we think that represents the downward pressure uh, in the UK from Chinese prices. So let's combine those four models. That was a very brief tour of four econometric models. But here I've summarized them in these four equations here. So notice that we modeled real wage growth, but now I've just matched that to nominal wage growth. And this F tilde is that wage price spiral, the nonlinearity that, that matters there. Everything that's exogenous is collected in these capital D terms. So in those four equations, there are a lot of variables in the models that were relevant, and they're all picked up by these capital D terms, other than what I've called endogenous variables, in other words, the variables from the four equation system. So I'm actually going to make a simplifying assumption. I'm going to close off that second nonlinearity, which was the nonlinearity in unemployment. If you recall, the nonlinearity kicks in when unemployment rate goes above about 8%. And in the UK, we're well away from that at the moment. So we don't need to worry about that second nonlinearity. Instead, we need to worry more about the wage price spiral. So we'll close that off. And then we can just do substitution to solve out for price inflation as a function of all of the exogenous variables in those four models. And we can take the coefficients uh, from the estimated models to back out the actual parameters for this solved out price inflation model. So we're going to need to make some assumptions on what the wage price spiral, this nonlinearity, is going to be doing. So I'll consider two cases to start with. The first is when workers demand 100% uh, compensation for inflation. So in other words, they want uh, nominal wages to match the price inflation. The second is we'll look at when workers demand 50% of inflation as compensation. So that's when F tilde is minus a half. So we can then back out the parameter uh, estimates for this sold out price inflation model and then substitute in all of the other drivers that we had, the exogenous variables. And this is our final uh, conditional model for price inflation. So let me talk you through what matters here. So increases in the growth of broad money, energy prices, world prices, the markup and the long-term interest rate are all going to raise inflation. And increases in capital, energy and the short-term interest rate all reduce inflation. And so if, for example, if you were thinking back to 2022 when we had this uh, energy shock, if we had a reduction in energy availability of, say, 10%, it's going to reduce output by 2.8%, as you can see from the production function, and that would exacerbate inflation by 2% through the price inflation curve. So what are the implications for current inflation? Well, rapidly rising price inflation can stem from commodity price inflation, as we've seen in there. A tight labor market driving very low unemployment levels means that that second nonlinearity is not going to kick in. But low productivity from the recession is likely to dampen the effect on real wage growth. But unfortunately, the second round effects via the wage price spiral are really very significant, and they can exacerbate the inflationary pressures. And that's going to dominate the lack of productivity effect. OK, so that's the model that we're going to use to forecast. Note that it's an annual model. And so I want to forecast 2023 and 2024. Um, but I've got more up-to-date information than just the annual data looking backwards. So I'm going to come up with some assumptions for what I'll call scenario projections for inflation. Now, uh, when we started doing this, uh, we looked back in 2022, and really we just made some projections based on judgment because uh, we were concerned about energy price inflation. And so we put in a prediction for energy price inflation, that's the delta P0 here, of 150%. So we thought uh, energy prices would rise by 150% over 2022. It actually turned out that they rose by 170%, so that wasn't a bad uh, prediction, um, but uh, pretty, uh, pretty sizable uh, increase in energy prices. 
So they were just based on judgment, but we can do a bit better than that. We can formalize these scenario, uh, uh, sort of maybe you can call them initial conditions. And to do that, we'll use a, a technique called card T. So this was a method we developed in the M4 forecasting competition, which is essentially a univariate statistical forecasting model. And the idea of card T is that we estimate three univariate statistical forecasting models. We start off by looking at an S, uh, a damped trend based on first differencing differences, uh, removing large values, but we add in seasonality. The second model is an autoregressive model with seasonality, but we force a unit root if we're close to that. And the third model is we estimate a trend halved integrated moving average model. And those three models, we then just take the average of those, just a simple arithmetic mean, and then we treat those forecasts of that average as if they were observed. So we treat them as if they're part of the data rather than forecasts. And then we estimate a richer autoregressive model over that forecasting period. And then the fitted values from that model become our final forecasts, undoing any transformations that we did in the process. So that's the method that we'll use to get some scenario projections for these conditioning variables. So let's look at broad money. We're going to need a projection of broad money over this period. And this is actually very straightforward. It's a simple extrapolation. So we're going to put in forecasts of about 3% for 2023 and 2024. What about world prices? Well, not much is going on in world prices either. So we put in projections of 1% and 3.5%. Um, what about uh, commodity prices? We put in predictions of minus 34% for commodity prices. Uh, Long-term interest rate, uh, we put in about 3.6%. Uh, capital per worker, unfortunately, we have, do not have high frequency data for capital per worker. So simple extrapolations of about 1 or 1.2%. And energy per unit of capital is falling, so that's going to be running at about minus 8%. So all of those we're going to put into our assumptions, and you can see these are the assumptions we've now included uh, as the baseline assumptions for our inflation projections uh, for 2023 and 2024. So from those, we can now produce our inflation forecasts. So what are our uh, inflation, well, I guess these should be now cast made in 2023, given that our scenario projections were based in 20, uh, March 2023. So if we assume full pass-throughs, so that is the wage price spiral has a full impact. So workers put in 100% demand uh, for the price inflation that they've seen. In that scenario, we predict inflation to run at 10%. And uh, you can see the composition of that effect. Uh, the rise in short-term interest rate has this uh, very significant downward pull on uh, price inflation, but actually is counteracted by the long-term interest rate. Um, so that 10% seems actually not far from what it looks like we might be at. If we had less pass-through, so if the wage price spiral didn't fully kick in and workers obtained, say, only 50% of price inflation into their wages, we would predict inflation of about 5.4% over uh, 2023. So you can see what effect the wage price spiral has. That's a really dramatic shift from 10% down to 5.4%, depending on this nonlinearity that's kicking in. So these are the point forecasts for annual inflation over this period. If we have full pass-through, 2022 would have been about 12.5%, then at 10%, and then next in 2024 down at 7.4%, much lower if the government can prevent the wage price spiral from kicking off, uh, which there's little evidence that it can do. So we can actually do a bit better than that. Let's go back to 2022 and see how well we did and use that to try and figure out exactly how much pass through of the wage price spiral there is. So in 2022, our scenario was that there was an equally weighted rise of 50% increase in oil and 250% increase in natural gas. That's what drove the 150% increase in commodity prices. And you can see the commodity prices is this blue bar with a six on. So that 6% of inflation was driven by commodity prices in 2022 out of the 12.5%. So half of the rise in inflation was predicted to come through commodity price inflation. Short-term interest rates would need to rise to 5% to offset the direct contributions of those energy price rises. And we can see the direction of which uh, short-term interest rates are moving in. 
Now, actual inflation reached 11.1%, but if we look at the annualised inflation rate over 2022, it was 9%. So from that actual outturn, 9%, we can actually reverse engineer exactly what the degree of pass-through was given known values. So we can use the realised values for 2022 uh, for commodity prices, world prices at 8.3%, the short-term interest rate, of course, short-term interest rate was rising over this time, but over the year it averaged 2%, long-term interest rate at 2.5%, broad money growth at about 6%. Uh, and given those, if inflation was 9%, we would have seen a pass-through of about 0.8%. In other words, 80% of the rise in prices were demanded for in rising wages. So using that estimate of 0.8, we can then look at the impact of inflation based on our scenario uh, assumptions that we had. So for an 80% pass-through, we predict inflation will be 7.5% in 2023 and 5.6% in 2024. So the Bank of England are forecasting inflation of 8.3% in 2023. 2023 quarter two, so an annualised forecast of 7.7%. So we're very close to their prediction for 2023. However, we're not as optimistic as they are for 2024. We're significantly higher at 5.6% relative to their prediction of 3.3%. So it does suggest that uh, this degree of pass-through really, thanks, really matters. It hinges on the non-linearity of the wage price spiral. And uh, there's quite a bit of evidence coming out, certainly in the UK at the moment, that actually wage price spirals are really starting to be embedded within the system. So let me conclude. There's been a recent rise in UK price inflation. It was unanticipated, but it certainly wasn't new by historical data. And so the history can shed light on the current inflationary climate. And therefore, using this long-run time series of data, which has a lot of variation in inflation over the time period, can help us to identify the explanatory factors and non-linearities. So that wage price spiral would be impossible to identify if we didn't have the 1920s and 30s in our data set. We also need to model structural breaks and distributional shifts, and saturation techniques were really crucial to getting congruent models for these periods. The conditional empirical models jointly model the dynamics, location shifts, relevant variables, and nonlinearities. But of course, here's the rub, and this is where I think you're going to attack me on. So the methodology doesn't produce uncertainty bands or distributional forecasts. And the uncertainty that we get stems not only from model uncertainty, because we've done a lot of selection and parameter estimation uncertainty, but also the uncertainty from those scenario assumptions that I started with as well. And so I guess my question to you today, it would be very helpful to have some feedback, is how do you think we can embed all of those measures of uncertainty when thinking about our point forecasts here? But it's important to use automatic tests for super exogeneity. That justifies our single equation modeling. But then we combine those models uh, to get out a system forecast. But you see, we can't do a system, for, system model directly off because the wage price spiral in the real wage equation includes contemporaneous price inflation in a nonlinear functional form. So it's very hard to think about how one can do at the outset a system model. So I think this is a way to justify actually getting a system by doing it in a series of single equation models. Finally, price and wage equations combined with nonlinearities can give us projections for the contributions to inflation. So it's quite useful to see what the breakdown is, where are the impacts coming from. So despite the fact that the commodity price inflation actually had a very small coefficient on price inflation model, actually the sheer magnitude of the jump in commodity prices meant that it contributed half of the rise in inflation in 2022. And energy costs along with unit labor costs really do seem to be fundamental to explain past inflation episodes and therefore are very useful for thinking about current inflationary episodes. So, thank you. Perfect timing. Any questions from the floor? Thanks, thanks for the uh, very nice presentation. I guess I have two comments or really questions. The first one is, perhaps I missed that in the model, but I was wondering what is the, if there is any role of uh, um, expected inflation, so uh, inflation expectations, um, because that's typically what you know uh, workers really uh, try to renegotiate their salaries on. Um, and then perhaps related to that, um, I guess one could argue that if you don't increase labor costs, then you know you kind of trigger strikes. And you know if you live in London, you see that every day, uh, every other day. 
And so that essentially is a labor supply shock. So I was wondering, you know, if you had a thought on the interplay between these two things, increasing labor costs or vis-a-vis -vis, uh, labor supply shocks. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Jenny, for this presentation. So, uh, except if I miss it, which may be the case, you did not mention the great moderation effect, right? That is a fact that starting from uh, 82, 84, uh, you see what I mean, uh, Gabriel? <laughs> we don't have any reduction, a reduction in cycles. It's something that we have in most countries, but, but uh, it doesn't seem that you have this for the UK. And the second point, you did not mention something that happened in June 2016, that is the Brexit. So I was wondering to what extent the Brexit uh, can have an effect, any structural effect on uh, exchange rate, productivity, inflation, stuff like that, and if you account for this in your, in your forecast. Thanks. I would like to ask about the uh, equation for inflation. You have also money in there. Do you also consider the higher order of uh, money inflation uh, effect on inflation so you can trigger some spirals with this and uh, may it be a way to to model the effects of uh, like asset purchase programs and uh, lots of expansion of the balance sheets sorry me first quickly <laughs> it's, it's very short um, you know i mean your, your equations are a bit in the spirit of this old layered nitro checkman uh, approach right and they, they had the price wedge as an important determinant of, of a of price wedge spiral in there so the difference between the gdp deflator and the hic or the cpi you know so i wondered about that Hi, so very nice talk, thank you. Uh, I was wondering on the price equation. So something that I have experienced is that when you include inflation expectations, which I, I was missing in the equations, you capture some of the non-linearities are directly going into the inflation expectations because they are a fast, I don't know here on the yearly, but the capture of the non, all the non-linearities that you might find in the wages or in the unemployment, as you were mentioning. So why you didn't include inflation expectations? Uh, Thank you for the nice presentation um, about the um, way you um, present the econometric uh, results, the regression results. I, I like very much that you also put the diagnostics uh, there below so you know uh, what the fit is. But the R squared is almost consistently about 0 0.98, 0 0.97. And that feels sort of like you think, well, such a great fit for these single equation models. And then as a time series regression person, you think, well, maybe there's some sort of like uh, problem in, uh, in, in, comp, uh, in, in, in well, with, with non-stationarity and I don't think that that is really the case. I think it is much more because you do all the saturations that you have all these big outliers that you are taking out and they of course explain a lot of the variation. So should you not present the R squared without the uh, uh, outliers and breaks in so basically have instead of the residual sum of squares or the total sum of squares that you basically uh, account the total sum of squares with the outliers and stuff. And that gives, I think, a more realistic uh, aspect. I have a question myself. Um, something that worries me a little bit uh, is the fact that the feeding in sample do not mean necessarily predictive power. And then uh, I would like to suppose that there is a, a, a dummy now that explains something that is not included in the past, but you don't know if it's happening right now, then perhaps something of like estimating this thing in kind of like auto sample experiments saying like see with your model up to what point you will have been able to forecast future inflation and so predictive power auto sample not just feeding in sample and then just doing one exercise of the sample okay then there are no more questions okay. your time
Thank you very much for those uh, excellent questions. I hope I'll uh, be able to address them all. Um, so let me start off with inflation expectations because there were two questions about why inflation expectations were not included. So the pragmatic answer, unfortunately, is that we just don't have the data on it going back to 1860. Uh, and obviously, it would be wonderful to include inflation expectations. Uh, but over this long time period, we, we, we just don't have the data. Um, I'm less worried about not including inflation expectations because I think over 160 years, it's very hard to think about how inflation expectations would have essentially been a constant effect over, over there. I think it would have had a very uh, variable effect over time. Uh, and actually, I think a lot of what the model can pick up is uh, things that can capture inflation expectations without directly including them. But I completely take the point that that is a drawback of looking at these long time series models. And I think the answer would be to say, let's think of it as just one model in a suite of models of which many include inflation expectations. So a bit of a get out, but that's uh, my answer on inflation expectations. In terms of the question about um, the strikes and whether we should interpret uh, labor costs versus labor supply shocks, uh, again, yes, uh, that's a very relevant point. And if you look over this long run time series of data, the number of periods in which there were really significant strikes in the UK um, versus periods in which there were significant uh, labor cost effects, um, and we don't disentangle the two. Uh, now, one might be able to argue that actually the impulse indicators could pick up the strike effect separately from the price, uh, from the labour cost effect, but I'm not sure that it's actually doing that. Um, one way to test that would be to take the dates of all the strikes over the 160-year period and see how they map to uh, the impulse indicators that we pick up. But in many of the cases, very few impulse indicators were picked up, so I'm not sure that actually we need that. But I, I think the point is a really good one, and I think we probably need to drill down to just the real wage equation in order to try and uh, disentangle the effect of the, the sort of supply side versus the cost side uh, issue. But very good point. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll follow up on that one. Uh, so the next questions are about the great moderation and the 2016 Brexit shock. So the whole uh, benefit of the impulse uh, saturation methodology is that we can be agnostic about when shocks occur. It's just whether they occur in the data. So we don't impose the idea that there is a Brexit shock. And in fact, we you'll see in the data, we do not pick up uh, a shift for Brexit. And I think that's because Brexit is a massive shock to the UK economy. That's undoubtable. But it's uh, it didn't occur in a one-off shift. In fact, I think it's a gradual process that's changing the entire structure of the economy. And I think that's much harder to pick up. So one way we could think about picking up uh, that kind of shock is by slow, slowly evolving um, uh, shocks over time. So we might think of slowly evolving trend changes that occur from the point of the Brexit referendum, but actually have only started to be implemented once Brexit was actually implemented. And who knows how Brexit is eventually going to be implemented. So I think that's something that one probably needs to wait uh, some time in order to disentangle. The great moderation, uh, again, I mean, we, we don't pick up any big shifts. And so that suggests that actually the great moderation, just there's a, just a reduction in volatility over time. Um, one thing you might say, well, we need to be modeling time varying volatility over this period as well. But actually, the, the diagnostics for the model suggest that uh, our model is well behaved regardless. Uh, we don't need to model time varying volatility over this period. So, uh, I, yeah, maybe the great moderation wasn't such a big shock in the, uh, not shock, but the opposite of a shock in the UK to uh, what one might anticipate. Um, in terms of the higher order effects of money, now uh, we have a test for nonlinearity. Um, so, uh, which essentially creates um, polynomials of all the principal components of all the regressors in the model. And then we take uh, the polynomials of these principal components. The nice thing about that is that they're all orthogonal. And then we test for the higher order uh, polynomials. And for the price equation, actually, we didn't find any evidence that they mattered. And therefore, we didn't go down the route of nonlinear modeling, and hence uh, including polynomials of, say, broad money in there, um, because we 
we didn't find evidence of the nonlinearity through the price equation. All of the nonlinearity was coming through real wages there. Uh, but we, we did test for it. Um, but I think uh, over this very long time series, the impact of broad money is actually sort of, if you think about, you know, how central banks have been setting monetary policy over this really long time period, it's very hard to see how... Um, uh, broad money has had this sort of constant effect over time. Uh, in terms of the price wedge, that was a really good point. We don't have CPI data going back to 1860, unfortunately. It would be lovely to include that, uh, but that's why we model the GDP deflator rather than the CPI. Uh, yeah, we just don't have the data. Um, but if anyone is working on historical data and can and can get that for us that would be wonderful and something very important to test so again i think the argument is this just has to be one of a suite of models where one could uh, use uh, more recent data to look at issues like the price wedge there um uh, the R squared, really good point. So I must admit, I've been taught never to look at R squared. <laughs> um, but but you are right. And yeah, I, 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 it's not an issue of non-stationarity. It's uh, we are um, essentially modeling a lot with the impulses and the steps. And uh, I think you're right. It's very important to exclude those, particularly when we're looking at forecast confidence intervals as well, because we don't want to essentially under predict the degree of certainty that we have over the forecast period by the fact that we've fitted a model fairly well by capturing the impulses and steps and so you can actually back out both um, the equation standard error with and without the impulses and do a comparison because if you're doing all of the work through the impulses and steps you'd worry about the model um, so uh, very good point and I will correct that in a future papers. And then finally, the predictive power out of sample. Um, yeah, so one of the constraints of the model that we have is, of course, it's based on contemporaneous data. So all of our conditional models have contemporaneous variables in, in the conditioning model. And so if we wanted to look at um, truly ex ante predictive power, um, we would then need to model all of our conditioning variables as well. And there's evidence that actually uh, the more uh, there's a forecast taxonomy um, that we have when we have um, exogenous variables that also need to be forecast, that introduces a whole new layer of forecasting mistakes that one can make. Um, and so I guess that's the concern by trying to model these contemporaneous uh, regresses in a forecasting context. But that would be the true test of uh, the model constancy, indeed. So I agree. Okay. So I hope I've answered everyone's questions. Profit margin is now very crucial. Uh, uh, issue for the euro system. Um, there is a box also in the latest BMP report. So uh, we we like to hear from you how you calculate profit margins. For instance, the most national bank uh, banks uh, use the simplicity simplicity rule, uh, the deviation from uh, GDP at basic prices minus uh, unit labor cost or unit profits, which is the ratio. Uh, from a gross op operational surplus over GDP. Uh, thank you. <laughs> yes, again, I'm afraid it is an issue of data constraints over this long time series because we need data back to 1860. So it is purely just the markup of uh, GDP over unit labour costs. That's all. Sorry. <laughs> 